You got it? Hi, everyone. Welcome to Advocates for Children's Special Education During COVID webinar. I'm Kim Madden. I'm the Director of Family Support at Advocates for Children. And I'm Liliana Diaz, and I run the Parent Center at Advocates for Children. And today we're going to be talking about special education during COVID, navigating special education services in New York City during remote learning. As people are coming in, I'll give you some information as to how we're going to interact during this presentation. Um, you'll see that there is a Q&A uh, box in your screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter them at any time and we'll try to answer them as we go along. We're aware that some of you already sent information, some questions that you had or some thoughts about issues that you had been seeing in special education during COVID. Um, we will try to address those during the presentation. However, we would also appreciate you sharing any information about things that you have seen, uh, concerns that you may have had um, that are not necessarily question. Uh, but that may allow us now to find out a little bit more information about what's going on um, with your families, with your own family, okay? All, All right. right, so we're at 50 people. I think we're gonna uh, give it just another minute or so. Um, yeah, and then we'll start. All right, Kim. Okay. All right, so today's training is going to have a bit of introduction. So we're going to ask you a couple of very small, short questions to get to know you. And then, uh, then we'll get started with COVID resources and information. And finally, a review of special education rights and then a review of issues we're hearing about. And like I said, please feel free to enter any information um, about questions that you may have or things that you're seeing uh, in your communities. So we're gonna launch our first poll. Oops, it's all right. And we're gonna give it just one more second before we end the poll. All right. We're gonna share the results. So welcome to parents, educators, and other professionals. We're gonna launch um, our second poll now just to find out where you're coming from. Where do you live? Okay, I think we're good. I think uh, you can see Brooklyn and the Bronx are represented quite well. Um, Staten Island, we miss you. Um, and other will welcome from wherever you come from for joining us today. And now let's get started. And we are, for people who are from outside the city, I know you may work with people in the city or you know live in the city, but be someplace else now. We are gonna focus, this presentation is about New York City. All right. All right, Kim, let's put the poll away and let's get started. So what is Advocates for Children? So for those of you who do not know us, Advocates for Children is an independent agency uh, that protects the rights of all New York City students. We're education centered. All the work that we do is around education in New York City. We have some basic services and all our services are free. We have a free helpline that runs four days a week, Monday through Thursday, 10 in the morning until four in the afternoon. And the helpline number is on the screen. I wanna highlight that some of, you'll see some blue uh, links and other live links in the presentation, which will be sent to you afterwards so that you can click and connect directly through those links rather than to have to copy them later. Um, we have a ton of guides and resources in multiple languages on our website in the section, Get Help. Um, we offer free workshops and trainings for the time being virtually, uh, but in regular times we would come to you um, and work with your population. And then we offer free legal services to families who are under a certain income. Um, the first step though, is for you to contact us through our helpline um, to try to seek information and for us to be able to vet your, your case. 
Um, in general, if you have any questions about education in New York City, you should feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we will try to address your questions and offer you guidance and information as to what you may be able to do. Sorry, hold on a second. Don't worry. We have, like I said, we have a, a lot of updates on our website. There's a ton of information that's been changing pretty frequently these days as uh, new information uh, comes to us, we update our website. And so this is a first place where you can land to start getting information about not only what's happening with COVID-19 and how the Department of Education is addressing it, but about information um, that you may need in the future on issues related to education. We have also been conducting quite a number of workshops on different uh, themes during the COVID closings. Um, they are archived on our YouTube channel and the link is in the bottom. And like I said, you're gonna get a copy of this presentation um, later on. But the, the subjects that we have selected for uh, webinars are very diverse from early childhood through graduation, uh, special education and know your rights um, for special populations. I will encourage you to go and visit the YouTube channel to see if there are other subjects that you may want to, um, to just learn a little bit more about. Yeah, and today we are gonna focus on the issues that have, we've been hearing about with special education and COVID. Um, to some extent, it's a bit of an advanced training and that we're going to assume a knowledge of IEPs and related services and things like that. If you do need or would like some more basic information, I would definitely encourage you to check out our special education workshop. And we actually, this is just a screenshot. There's a lot more workshops that are available online. All right, and I also wanted to remind you, um, Kim Madden and Liliana diaz Pedrosa were your presenters today for those of you who came a little bit later. Um, we also wanted to give you some links to where you can find uh, beefier information. So information that's perhaps a lot more detailed than what we can offer here, but that may be helpful to you in seeking answers after this is all said and done. So in the Department of Education website, these are live links to school closing information, um, special education guidance, multilingual learners and language supports for parents. So click on those links if you want more detailed information about any of these subjects. We also have on the next slide, uh, live links for the Teachers Union, the UFT website. They have, have gathered a lot of very good um, resources, including class size ratio agreements for some of you who had questions about what the class rations are supposed to be for specific types of classrooms, um, the amount of live instruction per grade, and other UFT agreements or policies that may be relevant to the way that services are delivered during COVID. Yeah, and just one note on the class size ratio, because that is one of the more common questions we've been getting on our helpline, and I will cover it a little bit later in it. But if you click on this link, uh, which as we said, this presentation will be emailed to everybody who registered, uh, at least by tomorrow. So you should get this and be able to click on it. Um, you have to scroll somewhat down the website to get to the section on class size ratios. Yeah. And then now for some general updates, some of you may be familiar with um, the fact that some schools have closed for at least two weeks because of rising cases. Um, and that the New York state has designated certain areas depending on how many uh, of the rise in incidence of COVID cases in the zone where those school schools are located as in red and orange zones um, and yellow zones. So the schools in red and orange zones generally have to close unless they can follow new state testing protocols as of today. Those state testing protocols include mass testing and weekly surveillance, but they may change and therefore um, there is a link to what may occur in the future where they're going to update should those testing protocols change. Um, schools in yellow zones have to test for COVID-19 weekly. To find out your school's COVID-19 zone color, go to this link and it will show you a map of the currently active uh, zones with their colors. So now, welcome to general principles of special education law. We are not going to be covering special education in depth. This is going to be uh, general principles and an overview. Um, we really wanna cover how things are presenting um, 
during COVID. So typically, uh, special education law from um, special education comes from a series of laws that authorize and create services for students and individuals with disabilities. The most important one is the IDEA, which is the federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, followed by Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. In New York City, you will find the New York State Education Law and Regulations, which enact the federal um, law and regulation in part 200. It's going to detail a little bit more how New York State is going to offer special education services. In New York City specifically, you'll find the chancellor's regulations, which are the local regulations, and they cover a whole bunch of different um, themes, including discipline, but also the provision of some special education services. Um, and then the New, York, the New York City Department of Education Standard Operating Procedures Manual is sort of the how-to uh, for the Department of Education. It answers some very specific questions as to how things are supposed to be offered in New York City and how the Department of Education expects things to be conducted. So it had, turns out to be a pretty interesting document. I think that's my hook to go to the next slide. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. That was an accident. <laughs> no, okay. All right, I'll move on to the next slide. So. The IDA, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, is a pretty complicated uh, piece of legislation, but it can be really easily summarized by saying that all children with a disability are entitled to a free and appropriate public education, which is FAPE, um, in the least restrictive environment. Um, so those words, of course, each one of those words has specific meaning. For today, we're going to be talking about children 5 to 21 in general. Um, so when we're talking about certain pieces of a legislation, be aware that there may be um, obviously much slight differences for younger children for early childhood class of, um, eligibility, for example, and then for older children through the age of 26. But today we're going to focus through age 21. I see there are some questions in the Q&A. And we will get to those questions in just a minute. I welcome you to please continue sending questions. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So as I said, some of these words, the uh, free appropriate public education and the least restrictive environment um, have very specific meaning for special education. So under the IDEA, a free and appropriate public education means um, that services are specifically tailored to meet a student's needs. Um, they're custom tailored, they're designed to enable that child to make a meaningful, uh, to provide a meaningful benefit, to enable them to make progress. Um, it is supposed to be a Chevy, not a Cadillac. And by that, we mean, Oops. Kim, <laughs> by that, we mean that it is not a broken down bicycle and it is not a luxurious state of the art thing. FAPE appropriate means that the services your child receives are not, um, the best, they are what's required to enable them to make progress. And this is really important to remember because there is an urgency for children to receive the services that they require to make progress. It is not a luxury, it is what's necessary. So when we speak about special education services, um, you must remember that what a child needs to make progress is not a luxury, it is just what's needed. And it is the basic requirement of the law that those services be offered to a child. We can go for the other one. Okay. Well, this is me, so hopefully I'll stop advancing in the and same with, way. With the questions now. Yeah. Um, so some of the issues that ASC has been hearing about uh, this fall um, are program issues. So, and I know that from some of the questions that people have raised, uh, many of you have similar questions. Um, we've heard questions about the hybrid and remote, uh, how that's working, the coordination, the different teachers. We've heard a number of people raising issues about ratio issues um, in their classes. And then also teachers, is there a teacher? Is there a special ed teacher? Do they know the teacher? Um, how interactive is the teacher? Uh, all these things are coming up. We've also been hearing about related services issues. Uh, one of the most common ones is scheduling problems. Uh, and with all of these, I'm gonna go through each section in more detail about what we would recommend and what was seen. Um, but so scheduling problems where, you know, you can get physical therapy and English, but you're gonna get them at the same time and remotely that's really not gonna work. Um, we've also heard about uh, parents really wanting related services in person and being told that wasn't possible. Um, 
evaluations have come up a lot. And in fact, one of the most common questions we got ahead of this is about triennial evaluations and can my child be evaluated? Um, we've heard a lot about delays and we've heard that people have been having trouble getting them in person. So we'll tell you what we know so far. I think the caveat that we have in all of the trainings that we're doing during this time is we'll tell you what we've heard, what we've seen, what the guidance is, and we know that what you hear and see in your own child's school um, may be really different. So we're trying to help you figure out how to, you know, escalate problems, how to try to resolve them. Um, and we know that this is a really, a time where we're seeing a lot of really different practices on the ground. Okay, so, oh, and this is one of the more common questions that we've been getting. Um, when can I opt back into person, uh, to in-person learning um, with the, with the, you know, Big disclaimer, if you've been following the news, unfortunately, New York City uh, COVID cases are on the rise and everything may be remote again if it goes above 3%. I think we're at two something now. Um, so, you know, this is what's true today. Uh, by November 15th, which I think is Sunday, so you really have to make this decision soon. Um, if you want to opt into the hybrid blended learning, if you're like, what is that? We have covered this in some of the earlier trainings that are on our webinar, so you can refer to that. But it's basically where you go to school in person on some days and other days you're at home getting instruction. Uh, you have to log into this form. That is a hyperlink there, that blue uh, you know, text where you fill out the form and say you want to go back in person. Um, what that means is you don't go back in person on November 16th. It means that after November 30th, you go back on your scheduled day. Um, so for my son's school, for example, what they offered for the hybrid was every third school day, which is incredibly confusing. Uh, it's never the same day every week. Um, but so if his actual third day fell on December 2nd, that's when he would go in. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then anytime you can choose remote again. Uh, so this has always been true that if at some point you get nervous or things don't work out or it, for whatever reason you've decided, I don't wanna send my child into school anymore. You can always choose remote. Uh, the reverse though is not true. Originally when we did this training in the spring and over, I'm sorry, in the summer when they said they were opening schools back up, it seemed like there were going to be multiple opportunities to opt back in. They were originally saying quarterly. Um, they're now saying this is it uh, by November 15th. So my guess is that what they're saying is it will open for everybody or this is it if you wanna do the hybrid. Um, it's really not clear. Obviously the answers on that have been changing, but I would say if you want hybrid, you could opt for it now. Uh, something we have heard is people saying, well, I'll opt into it now, but I'm not gonna send my child now because things are going up, but I want the option. That's not gonna work if you're not sending your child in person. Most schools, in my understanding of what I've heard is most schools have a policy where if you don't show up for a certain number of days and it's not, you know, your child has a cold or something or the bus didn't show up. Uh, if you're not sending your child in, they will switch you to remote. Um, okay, so that's the opting back into person. All right, so we can pause now for questions. Okay, so uh, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say one of the questions was about is the school required to send a draft of the IEP before the IEP meeting? Um, we're going to get to that in the IEP section, which is later. So it's a really good question. Any other questions, Liana, that you think we ought yeah. to be flagging? Um, so, um, so one of the questions was specifically around ideas how a parent can navigate for children that require a bus para. Um, when the para, this actually is a tricky one. So the Department of Education is paying for the para's transportation, you know, is paying for the para on the bus, but then the paraprofessional has to spend about three or, you know, six hours waiting for the student to come back. And so the para is no longer there. Um, so the, the question is around how to enable a, the Department of Education to offer a paraprofessional uh, when, the para, when the Department of Education is not paying for the paraprofessional full-time. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that the question there is, uh, this actually is a tricky one during, uh, in school as well, probably, I, I don't know if it's harder or easier now, you would think it would be easier because there's a lot of paras who are not 
um, really doing much in person right now. Uh, but it is always hard to find a transportation power for that exact reason. Um, what I would say is you do have a right to transportation. So they, I know that having a right and then reality in this case are often unfortunately far apart. But what I would say, and we're gonna cover it in a little bit, but go up the chain, talk to your principal, document it in writing, go up to the borough support, uh, you know, the, the support centers, or, you know, if you're in District 75, going to the District 75 central offices, go up to special education. Um, we're gonna go through the phone numbers and the email for them. And if it doesn't work and you're hitting a brick wall, which you may very well with this, um, definitely reach out to advocates for children. That's a kind of issue that we often are escalating up. Um, sometimes it's frustrating and they have a really hard time. The other thing I would say is if you can find somebody or identify somebody, we have seen parents be able to do that um, where they find somebody who's willing to do it and then getting the DOE to pay for it. Um, one of the easiest things to do is to try to find somebody who works at the school. Uh, you know, like all of these, a parent should not have to do that. But in reality, what we see a lot of times is parents coming up with a solution and giving it to the DOE. Um, so hopefully, you know, hopefully you can get it resolved. But I'm really sorry, you should not be having to transport your child yourself. No. Um, somebody asked, how do we get a copy of the SOPM? There is, when you get this presentation, you'll see the link. Um, it's on uh, the, it's actually on the slide um, that we presented earlier. Uh, and then there are other, some of these questions we're gonna answer in just a minute, such as how, what does apparel look like for a fully remote student? Um, how many ACTs are required for fully remote, for hybrid in person? And what is the maximum class size for um, one to five for fully remote and for hybrid remote, hybrid remote, excuse me. Um, so we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, we'll have an opportunity in just a few slides to come back some of, some of these questions. Um, do you want to continue with the presentation and get back? Yeah, to and you know what, I'm actually, I, I'd have to go back and check. I'm not sure if we do have the link to the New York City DOE SOPM. We might. Include it. If we don't, actually, for myself, what I always do is I Google it. If Google is often your friend with anything on the DOE's website. Um, it's under a site called InfoHub. It's not on the schools.nyc.gov. Yeah. I think it was last year they separated out the parent facing things, which are schools.nyc.gov, that website, from the things that are geared more towards school staff, but are available to parents. The SOPM for anybody who's like, what the heck is that? It's the Standard Operating Procedures Manual. It's an incredibly useful document for, uh, it's written for principals. Um, so it's pretty high level, really, you know, can be kind of jargony if you're not quite sure of all the terms in special ed. Um, but really useful to try to figure out, you know, how many days do they have to respond if I'm asking for an evaluation, et cetera. A lot of that stuff is in there. Um, it doesn't mean it's the law. In fact, there's some areas that we don't necessarily agree that it is the law, but it's really helpful to know what they're telling people they should be doing. That's actually why we included so many links in the beginning uh, for what's happening during COVID because the guidance is changing all the time. And I, uh, the links to that are really helpful. I found the UFT documents, which are absolutely not written for parents, um, but really are great at like, what should the class size be? What is the agreement that the DOE and the UFT came up with? Now, in all of those things, there's a caveat that they say, unless it can get you know, approved through something else. So um, during this time, you're gonna see a lot of things that don't match the guidance. Uh, and you know, if it's been approved centrally, then it's gonna to get tougher to escalate it. With all of it, um, just like our slide a little bit ago with the general basic rights, uh, with the kid with a t-shirt saying, I am the I in the IEP. The I in the IEP stands for individualized. If something is not working for you, regardless of what the, you know, the, the uh, guidance is, you should raise it, you should keep asking it and you know try to push it because this is a time when you know you're going to really need to be the one advocating for your child's education all right so uh most common questions whoops sorry uh so what if my child isn't getting the program on the iep um the most common issue we've heard about is the remote class was way over ratio uh, we had a parent call us who had two children in 12 to 1 to 1 classes on their IEPs who were in 28 person classes with one teacher. 
um, and she was raising that up. Uh, other things are no special ed teacher, you know, or no general education teacher, no instruction in school. So um, although the guidance is a lot of it is about, you know, having a special ed teacher in school and maybe slightly different support if you're remote for the students who are in the hybrid program, we certainly have heard about students not getting any instruction or getting right instruction in school. Um, and not enough support. This one is probably the most complex, but we're hearing this a lot where this remote learning um, is not, it doesn't work very well for all kids. And so trying to figure out how to make it work. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, the remote uh, class being way over ratio, um, one thing that you can see on the UFT uh, guidance is that Remote classes, if you choose fully remote, and that parent I was talking about earlier, whose two kids were both in way, way, way over ratio classes, that's completely wrong. They should have been in a 12 to one to one class remotely. Um, they had one teacher teaching 28 kids. I think they probably just combined two 12 to one to one classes into one. Um, when we raised that, the DOE's first answer is, oh, well, maybe it's not for core subjects. This parent actually screenshot her child's classes, which was great. I feel like uh, as a parent myself, one of my favorite things about my job is how much I learn from the people who contact us um, and how resourceful they are in fighting for their kids. So that was something where when we raised it again and said, no, this is really all day long. This is not an isolated thing. They were able to work with the school um, and they were able to find another teacher. So her kids are now in 12 to one to one classes remotely. Um, so it really is supposed to match the ratios. Uh, for ICTs, obviously much bigger classes are allowed. Um, for hybrid, it gets a little bit more complicated. So in person, obviously classes are typically way smaller um, because of the COVID social distancing. So, you know, if an ICT class would have 32 kids right now, it's probably, you know, it depends how big the classroom is, but it could be as few as six kids. It just depends on how many people have opted in and how big the classes are. Um, so the guidance says you're supposed to have, um, you know, the right teachers on your IEP in person. So if you have a small class, you should have a special ed teacher in person. If you have an ICT, you should have a special ed and a gen ed teacher. The tricky thing comes with the remote for the students who were in that hybrid program. Um, I'm sorry, I know this sounds so complicated, but for the kids that chose in-person some days, the remote days, uh, you know, for some of them, I think that they're not necessarily getting live instruction. And from what was seen in the guidance, you may not get a special ed teacher on those remote days. The idea is that the in-person teachers are supposed to be providing the support for the remote teacher that those three, if you're in an ICT, for example, they're supposed to be working together to support your child. Um, so that's the guidance. We have seen this all over the map with different things. In my own son's class, it's completely the reverse. They don't offer in-person instruction if he was going into school and we ultimately decided because of the para and the nurse and the transportation and all kinds of things that it, it didn't make sense. Um, but if he had opted for in-person, he would sit there and do his classes remote in person. Uh, but what they offer instead is the remote classes have a special ed teacher and a gen ed teacher and are the typical ratio that they would be. Uh, this is, he's part of a high school where there is a lot of high schools that shows this. It doesn't match the DOE's guidance. I think there's about 10,000 kids is the last thing I read on a, a newspaper article about it. Um, but so you have, we do see these programs that don't seem to entirely match up. And that's where I think over and over again, what I would say is try to understand what the school is offering, what the guidance says, what's on your child's IEP, and then maybe most importantly, what you think your child needs and to try to advocate for that as flexibly as you can. Um, we've seen people who are saying, okay, this really isn't working. I understand you don't have something uh, the class, but how about giving me some more sets at home or something different? Um, so I think that, you know, advocating, it's really important to have all the information you can, and it's what we're trying to give you today. Um, the PAD, I'm sorry, I'm putting in an acronym without the description. We're going to get to it in a minute. The PAD is the Program Adaptations Document. It's the new equivalent of what was the remote learning plan in the spring. 
And it's supposed to describe what a student is getting uh, during this time, whether remote or it, you know, in the hybrid program. And I, I keep saying this, so this is that point again, but ask for more support uh, if this is not working for your child. And you wanna be, as always, this isn't different um, pre-COVID. You wanna have as much uh, information as you can and as many details as you can about why your child needs something different. Okay, so the program adaptations document. It is not supposed to change the IEP. Uh, this part, I always have a hard time wrapping my head around because it's not supposed to change it, but then sometimes it seems to. Uh, but it is different than the remote learning plan. It really does have, unfortunately, a lot of generic language. So the teacher and the parent are supposed to have a conversation about it. If you are a parent on this call and saying, I don't even know what this is, I haven't gotten it, that's not right. You should have already gotten a copy of it. Most parents that we've spoken to, or I shouldn't say most, many parents we've spoken to have gotten it but had no idea what it meant. Uh, that's more typical. Um, it can be updated and revised. So if you have a new IEP meeting, they're supposed to be updating and revising the pad. Um, and if you need one or want to change it, you should be talking to a teacher that you're connecting to or the principal at your school, or you can email special education um, or call 311. We also have a special education number a little bit later on in this that you can call. Um, they are monitoring that email. So if you've gone up at the school and you haven't gotten a response back or you haven't gotten a response you like, I would definitely encourage you to go to the central email office if you're able to. Okay, sorry. Okay, so sections of the pad, and I know this came up with some of the questions before, it's supposed to go through the classroom program. This is the really generic language about uh, what remote and in-person is supposed to look like. It's mostly just guidance. Um, it has a whole section on assistive technology. Um, so for example, for my son, he uses a lot of assistive technology. And on his pad, they describe not only what's on his IEP, but what pieces are sent home. So there's some things on there that uh, he normally would only have in school. We were able to advocate for him to get one piece of that at home, things like that. Paraprofessionals is, I think, a very tricky uh, aspect, and we're going to show you that in a second in a um, more in-depth slide on this. Um, behavioral support. So students with behavioral issues, uh, from what we've heard, are having some of the hardest times at home because they don't have the support. Um, and it is supposed to describe, obviously, you can have a behavior intervention plan that works for school, but this is a really different time. So how does that work now? Um, and language supports. Parents and students are supposed to be uh, having communication in their preferred language. Um, and because of COVID, that can get a little bit tricky. If you have an alternate placement para, for example, um, your child speaks another language and they have a para to help support them in school, they're supposed to be describing how exactly that's gonna work now. Okay, this is the pad. Um, this is a quick you know, front page of one. Um, and the special ed program there really, uh, I think it's kind of unfortunate, but it just restates what was on the last IEP. If it gets that wrong, you should definitely raise it, but usually that's not the problem. Um, this is one where I say, can you find the individualized part? Uh, so you can read this and this is the paraprofessional. The student has a health para and a transportation para. Um, and the individualized part of this, you know, it says it doesn't change the IEP, all that, it's the same on everybody's, but this is the individualized part, where this is a parent who was really advocating uh, and got, um, whoops, sorry, uh, got a remote para to assist with her child, and that para was going to monitor um, uh, her child's ability to interact, to take notes of visible shifts in behavior. So they had some way for the para to participate in all of the online classes. Um, it really depends on the para. I think that uh, this isn't a student, a family that I worked with. It was a colleague of mine. Um, and you typically see paras, you know, this is a student who has a health para, but it also sounds like that health para was providing a lot of support instructionally for the student. Um, for other people, it's really complicated. Uh, my son has a para for health and for toileting. We don't have that person supporting him at home because they did not offer 
an at-home para, I think I could push for it more. Um, and that those are some of the things that we're seeing where parents are having a really hard time um, where, you know, my son can't access his iPad without the para. Um, to make it through the day, he needs constant, you know, hands-on support. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think you can and should be asking for more support from the DOE. We have heard of one student who had a para sent home, um, but unfortunately it's not the norm. For other people, having a para work remotely can work, and that's where it's supposed to be individualized and reflected in the pad in like a section like this one. Um, for students, uh, you know, for all students, the pad, like an IEP, is supposed to be based on what the student needs, not on what the school's resources are. So if a student needs a para remotely to be involved in all of his or her online classes, and that actual para can't do it because of their own childcare obligations, they're supposed to find a different para or to make this work. It's not supposed to be, oh, well, your typical para can't do that. They are supposed to meet what your child needs. So hopefully that helps answer that. Um, okay. okay, so how many students can be in a class? Uh, this is on the, you have, this is, we've had this link in a couple of places, but because it is a really common question, the agreements are on the UFT website. Um, ICT and small classes in any setting, remote, uh, obviously in person, but hybrid are supposed to keep the pre-COVID maximum sizes. That wasn't true at first or from what I had heard. So that's nice to know that the ICTs aren't supposed to be bigger even in the remote uh, or the hybrid remote section. Um, the class ratios that we have heard of being really large are the gen ed ones. Um, and that varies by grade and whether or not you're in person or remote. The largest sizes that I've seen or for the remote part of the hybrid ge general education classes, as high as 68 students. Um, so that's a lot of kids that remote teacher is supposed to be supporting. On the other hand, they took away the need for live instruction and remote days for students in hybrid programs. So that means that maybe that teacher is just grading a whole bunch of assignments or monitoring students' progress on them. Um, we actually have in the earlier slides of the UFT agreement, one of those links does go to how much live time should my child be getting a day? Because um, that was one of the biggest complaints we heard in the spring is people getting no live instruction. The DOE has now said uh, you should absolutely be getting live, meaning like the same way I'm talking to you, you're not looking at this on YouTube. If you're listening to me now, you're supposed to be getting that live instruction and interaction uh, your child should be getting that with their teacher um, a certain number of minutes every week. Okay, uh, so program plot problems. If you've heard all of this and you said, that sounds great, but that's not what's happening for me. Uh, the first place to start is always the school. Um, and maybe you've had some conversations, but I, I found that actually, I found this personally and professionally, you know, even if you've had a conversation where they said, oh, we can't do that, put it in writing and send it to the principal or the school psychologist, whoever is telling you no. Um, in fact, I would always include the principal, but if you've been talking to the school psychologist, include them too. And if you can put it in an email, that's great. Make sure you're documenting that conversation and you're being really clear about what the problem is and what you want. If that doesn't work, you can go up to the administrator of special education at the borough community office. This is a hyperlink here because if you click on it, it will tell you how to find that person's information. Um, and then if that doesn't work, you can go to DOE Central. Uh, this is the special education email again. We have this throughout this presentation. Um, and if it doesn't work, please call our helpline and let us know. Make sure you let us know who you've spoken to, what they've said, and what the problem is. And a lot of times what we can do um, is try to see if it's something where we feel like we might be able to help by reaching out to people. Um, as I said, that's frustrating when Often we're reaching out to the same people that you were, but we do find that sometimes when we raise things, sometimes we can get a different result. Okay, so now I'll pause for a minute and we'll see if there are some questions that came in. So we have a couple. Um, so we have a question from a, fa from a family who is homeschooling and wants to know about whether what they can say at the IEP meeting. And I started the answer to say, 
that a student can receive um, related services, even if they're being homeschooled. And I wanted to highlight the difference between homeschooling and home instruction. So homeschooling is where a parent crafts and creates a program, a school program that they want to offer, but they're not receiving education services from the Department of Education. However, a child remains um, eligible and entitled to services, uh, related services like speech, occupational therapy, et cetera, which can be created then in an IEP for the student to receive. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. And let me see if we have any open questions. Well, I see one about the comp services when services yeah. were reduced last year and central special ed said they're not offering. I'd actually love to see that if you have that in writing, if you can send that in. Uh, of course, that's not right. Um, they should be. I mean, it, is it going to be a one to one? Uh, you know, you missed 20 sessions of speech. I don't know. Is there going to give you 20 sessions of speech? Um, and uh, but I do think that it's individualized. So, you know, would you have to go through due process, meaning filing a hearing uh, to get that? I hope not. But I think if you can be as constructive and concrete in terms of what you're asking for, uh, you know, if they're not providing what's on your IEP, if they've violated your right to a free and appropriate public education or FAPE, you always have the right to ask for them to make that up. Now, obviously it is a pandemic, and I think some hearing officers might be sympathetic to the why, but if your child is suffering from this and uh, they haven't even followed their own guidance, which is things that we're hearing, you know, you certainly would have a right to ask for uh, compensatory services. Um, we do have, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, a more systemic response to this. If your child is over 19 and is having these issues, we have a number of cases that we've had with younger kids, but we are still looking for older kids. Uh, so if your child's over 19 and has not gotten what they need, um, please do reach out. Um, you can reach out through our helpline uh, and let us know. Um, or if you take the survey after this and want to put in the survey, you know, what your situation is, we'll try to reach back out to you. There's another question. Are school psychologists contact information public? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I was hoping that you would. Um, I actually don't know about that. I know we can find contact information for school principals, but I'm not 100% sure that the school psychologist contact information is public. I mean, where you would look would be on the school's website on the DOE, and that's where the principal's email is always there. The other thing I would say is if you know the name of the school psychologist, Google is your friend. Um, anybody who works at the DOE, uh, it's their first initial, their last name, and then confusingly, sometimes a number. Um, and at schools.nyc.gov, um, or you Google their name at schools.nyc.gov and you might find it. Um, okay, and then uh, we have another participant who said that they have reached out to uh, Central Department of Education multiple times about an evaluation to the CSE and have not heard back. Should we just contact you guys? And yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I'm so sorry, and yes. And as much as possible, if you have that in writing and can send that, um, we are gonna talk about that. Evaluations are an area we're hearing a lot of problems. And I wanna highlight the answer because yes, if when in doubt, contact us. It's not a wasted call and it's not a wasted email. We wanna track this information. If there's any way that we can smooth the process out for you, we will try. Um, so don't hold back on that. There is another question. Um, uh, there is a participant say, uh, asking um, if not requesting, if requesting a copy of the pad would affect the legal case. Um, they're saying often lawyers recommend that if the school doesn't mm -hmm. provide the parent with a copy of the IEP in a timely manner, that the family not request it. it is, this, is it the same with the pad? I mean, you know, it depends on what your goal is. If you know right now that you think you wanna sue, you should talk with your lawyer about it before taking any steps. This presentation is not meant to be legal advice. Uh, and certainly as a lawyer representing people, I represent people in a lot of different hearings for different things. Sometimes that actually does make sense where, you know, they didn't give you a placement, but you know, you don't want a public school placement. You don't go and ask them for a placement, for example. Um, 
On the other hand, I think the pad is a little bit more complicated. It, that's a really hard question to answer in the abstract. Um, and given the way it's framed, I would say, mm, if you have it, a question like that, that details, you should be thinking about what is your goal and do you need a lawyer to get there, no matter what the pad says, and then talk to the lawyer. Hopefully that answers that. I will add to that, um, if this is helpful to say, that the PAD is a New York City created document. It is not a required document like the IEP might be, even though the Department of Education has made it guidance that you should have one. Um, it is different than the IEP because the IEP is such a foundational uh, document in special education. So consider that distinction and weigh balance that with your need to know what services your child is required to get uh, right now and whether or not you may need to tweak it. Um, also remember that, uh, you know, it, the pad does not change the IEP either. Um, so all these things have to weigh, be weighed in and possibly like Kim said, you might need to consult somebody to get a fuller answer that speaks to your specific case. Okay. Uh, so have. related services problems. This is another really common thing we've had. Some of the issues we're hearing about is they're scheduled at the same time as class. Um, they're only offering remote and you want in person or it's less than what's on the IEP. Um, I think the first one is really interesting to me because to be honest, I think this happens far too frequently in actual physical school pre-COVID, but as parents, we don't know it. Um, maybe you have children who are better reporters, uh, but my son is like, ah, school was fine. Did you have OT? When did you have, he doesn't know, or he's not gonna tell me. Um, maybe he'll tell me, but it depends. Uh, and so I think that it is something that scheduling of related services and having them be a rational schedule um, so that you don't get pulled out. Uh, SETS, for example, special education teacher support services or tutoring. Um, I think most of us in our heads kind of lump it as a related service. It actually is more of an instructional program and in how the DOE thinks of it. But for example, we've seen lots of kids get SETS and be pulled out of the subject they're struggling in to go get support in it. And that means they miss the time that they need in class. That's obviously not a very good system. It's clearly set up about the SETS provider schedule and not the kids' needs. Um, we are seeing that with related services as well. It's certainly something that you should just push back on. Um, with all of these issues, uh, one of the things that we see is maybe that individual provider, this is the only time they're available, but the DOE is a big system. Maybe that school doesn't have another provider available who can offer this at a different time, but the DOE as a whole should. So it's the kind of thing where you should just keep raising it up and saying that doesn't work. You should not have to choose between OT and English. That's not how this is supposed to work. Um, offering remote is really similar. Uh, many parents we spoke to wanted in-person services. It depends on the type of service, but some services, for example, my son gets physical therapy and he has a physical disability. That's extremely hands-on remote really doesn't work that well for him. Uh, I mean, I think there's some people where remotely a PT can coach a parent and it's a very individualized determination, but for some kids remote just doesn't work. Um, but for example, at his school, the therapy room has no ventilation, no window, no, no vent at all. It's uh, you know sort of a repurposed big closet. They can't hold therapy sessions in there during COVID, it's just not safe. Um, so it is something where they have said no in-person services. Um, I think that you can push back and say, well, I want in-person. Is there another location it can be provided at? Um, is it something where you know, I can get an RSA, a related services authorization to try to find a provider um, so that can come to my home? Um, and finally, the last thing that we have heard a lot is people being offered what's less than what's on the IEP. Uh, similar to what I think sometimes happens in person, but it's tougher for parents to find out about it. But you know, you might have a speech therapist who's supposed to see your child four times a week and says, I can only do two. Or for example, for my son's therapists, they're all doing 30 minute sessions, not 45 minute sessions, which is on his IEP because of the way the remote schedule works. For me personally, I realized, you know, at first I was like, wait, that's a reduction. And then I looked at his actual schedule, thought about his day, the fact that he has zero breaks in between anything and went through it and realized, you know what, 
30 minutes works for us. I'm okay with that. But if I was not okay with that, I could raise it and ask for it because that's not what's on his IEP. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and that brings me to the RAD, which is, uh, we did not make these names up. The Related Services Authorization Document. We have all kinds of terrible jokes with things that rhyme with PAD and RAD at my office. Um, but so this is the, I, the RAD is a little bit better than the PAD in that there's an individualized section. So it says, here's what the IEP says. You know, you're supposed to get PT once a week, 30 minutes in the gym. Here's what you're gonna be getting during remote services. You're getting teletherapy. Um, so if that works for you, that's great. It's the teletherapy section. Um, so I think I covered this a little bit, but let's say you want something different than what's being provided. Uh, first, you should check the RAD. If you haven't gotten it, talk to the provider and ask them to send you a copy of it. Make sure you've raised your concerns. You want in-person PT. You don't want remote PT. Talk to your provider, talk to the principal, put it in writing. Um, also know what you think would work. Um, so, you know, I could stomp up and down and say, I want related services in person. If there really is no other room available, they're not going to be able to do that in his school because there's no ventilation there. They can't use another classroom or something. Um, so then trying to be flexible, like could, is there another school that your child could go to? Is there a contract agency, a related service provider in your neighborhood that you could take your child to? Do you have a related service provider you have a relationship with or you could find who could come to your house and you would feel safe with it? it there's so many individualized determinations along this uh, continuum, but trying to understand what it is you think you want. So that's always really helpful to ask. Um, if it doesn't work, going up to the, it's called the AZ, the Administrator for Special Education. And then once again, trying Central. And finally, if it doesn't work, call us. Oh, and I should say central, but this is not the special education email. This is actually a designated email for related services. Um, so you can try that one as well. Okay. Questions? Okay. Um, let's see. I think we covered a lot of the questions right now. Um, my client often has some phone turned off due to lack of financial resources. The school continues to blame my client for not knowing what is going on because they email her. Mm -hmm although she has limited literacy. Is there any other way to ensure she's receiving information? Yes, that's one that we actually just had a whole policy meeting at our office about trying to address it. Um, it's something that we refer to as the digital divide where the presumption right now at the DOE is that everybody has email, a working phone and internet and a device. And that's really not true. Um, we found that a lot of people uh, really struggle with this and it's hard to reach them. And obviously, you know, they're juggling a lot during this time. A lot of families are having a lot of struggles with, you know, food, with rent, with, you know, not being able to pay their phone bill, let alone being able to figure out some online form from the DOE. Um, we are certainly, I mean, I do think a school has an obligation to communicate with families in any way they can. We've seen examples of schools being really creative, um, you know, reaching out to families, trying to work with uh, the remote learning centers, or what do they call now, the learning bridges programs, um, doing things by mail. It actually is still possible to put a stamp in an envelope, send it in the mail and get it to people. One thing we've discovered during this time is that's one of the most effective forms of outreach. Um, and let's say that social worker or whoever at the school is trying to contact the parent doesn't have a printer, then email it to a colleague that does figure it out. Um, because that's something where for many parents who are not able to access things digitally, that's going to be the best way. And it is really important because the kids that are missing out right now, it's going to be really hard, as one of the earlier questions was about, it's going to be hard to catch up. Um, and we are seeing, you know, huge differences in parents with resources versus those that don't. Um, parents that are able to support their kids during remote learning and parents that can't. Uh, because they have to make sure that there's food and there's rent and all of that. Um, so it is, that's a really good question without a totally easy answer other than we think the DOE should be recognizing the digital divide a lot more, not making everything only email or online forms and trying to offer options. I would say you can call 311. Um, in a slide further on, we do have a section on uh, the cent uh, central special ed phone number. Um, so there are phone numbers to reach out to. 
Um, but it's tough. Okay. okay, and there were a couple of questions about translation and interpretation of documents. I will speak about that in just a minute, but I wanted to highlight an email address, which, address, which is hello at schools.nyc.gov. This is a dedicated line for language access issues. So if you're seeking to have an IEP translated, somebody had said that they had escalated um, through the CSE to have an IEP translated that came from a private school. Um, this is an email address where you can send that request and they, uh, they will give you an answer. And if you continue to have difficulties, you can also email us. We will, we will assist you in getting that IEP translated. All right. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, what if your child needs a new evaluation? I know this came up. It was one of the more common questions we've been getting. Um, many reasons why you might need a new evaluation if your child hasn't been evaluated in three years. This was one of the questions that came through ahead of time. They're up for what's called a triennial, meaning everybody's supposed to have a comprehensive evaluation every three years. Um, or you're struggling with learning in a new way. So something is coming up. Or just in general, you think your child needs more support. Um, some of the families we spoke with who were having the hardest time were newly identified kids that, you know, they were just starting the process in March. It was pretty clear they had just gotten a promotion and doubt letter, or people were saying you really do need to get an evaluation. And now they're, you know, this far into the pandemic and ha they haven't been able to get a thorough evaluation. Um, so evaluations during COVID, the IDEA still does apply you're supposed to be able to get free evaluations in all areas of suspected disability every three years, but you can get one more often if you request one. Um, and you can request one at any time, definitely do it in writing. Um, and remote evaluations, you definitely should be able to get. In-person evaluations if available if needed, I'm gonna cover that in a second. Um, but complications, you know, remote evaluations especially cognitive ones or for kids with, um, you know, trouble with, uh, you know, electronics, it is going to be difficult. So the million dollar question that we keep getting is, are there in-person evaluations? This spring, obviously, there were no in-person evaluations. Um, but unfortunately, what we were hearing from people were there were huge delays. Um, people were telling parents, you have to close the case, you have to withdraw your request. That's never right. Anytime somebody is telling you to do something because of their resources, as opposed to what you think you need for your child, you know, just say, no, don't do that. Um, but uh, we also saw situations where they were just saying, well, nothing's happening till the fall. At that point, we really were urging the DOE to try to figure out what they knew based on the information they already had. And even if it wasn't perfect, come up with an IEP based on what they knew. So for example, one of the kids that we were working with who, you know, her teacher knew that she needed an evaluation, uh, really felt like this student had some attentional issues that could be addressed by, you know, not that uncommon accommodations and needed an IEP for some more support. They had enough information to take a guess about what that child might need. And that's the kind of thing we were hoping they would do then. Um, in the summer, which feels like ages ago, I, I don't even remember when it was, June 15th, something like that was the first time I think Cuomo said, you can do some stuff in person and evaluations theoretically were gonna happen in person at some of the summer sites. But from what I heard, there were no DOE evaluations over the summer. And I think it had to do with a union negotiation or safety concerns, but they were not happening. We did see some independent providers doing evaluations. Um, so some families were able to get something called an IEE or an independent evaluation, uh, educational evaluation, you know, assessment form. And so they were able to find somebody to do an evaluation in person. Um, and for some evaluations, they really do need to be done in person. Uh, now you are supposed to be able to get in person. Um, there's something called a comprehensive data-driven assessment analysis. Um, and I'm gonna explain that in a second. Um, but from what we've seen, uh, even though you were supposed to be able to get in person from a while ago, I heard very mixed things. Uh, we heard they were doing them, and then we heard on the ground that they were not happening. Um, so it may be that you need to ask for an independent evaluation. That question earlier about, I've been waiting for months and I haven't gotten one at this point. 
you definitely should be entitled to an assessment authorization for an independent evaluation um, and or to an in-person evaluation if that's what you want from the DOE. Um, the process for getting an assessment authorization when they've blown the timelines for evaluations, that's an example of something where I often refer people to the SOPM. Um, so we will try to include the link to the SOPM in the email when we send this around to everybody. Um, and it's a pretty complicated section, but it does go through that. Um, and it's an important right. Okay, so CDDA, a new acronym in special ed, uh, stands for Comprehensive Data Driven Assessment. Um, this term kind of made me banana, drove me bananas because uh, how it's getting used, and that blue language is a link to the UFT guidance on it. Um, it's being used to mean uh, remote. Uh, so it means you're looking, it's kind of like what we were asking for in the spring. You're looking at everything, all the information you have, rather than saying we need to do the traditional psychoed. We need to do a WISC and a WIAT, academic and cognitive testing, and only in this way and only on these forms. They're trying to say, no, you can be more flexible and figure things out. That's a great idea, but it uh, makes me a little cynical that they're using that now, now that in-person evaluations are allowed. And also they're using it typically to mean remote evaluations, when to be honest, all evaluations in person or remote should be comprehensive data driven assessments. That's what's in the IDEA. It's supposed to be uh, comprehensive. So if you're hitting that wall of you want in person evaluations and they're saying no, and you have, you know, you want to know your reason for why you want in person, then go up the chain and contact us. Um, evaluations are supposed to, this is the comprehensive part of it that was true pre COVID. It's supposed to include everything. It's supposed to include, you know, classroom observations. That's obviously tricky right now, but they could look in on a Zoom classroom. Um, it's supposed to include OT, PT, speech, if that's something that's concerned, uh, is of a concern. Um, a psychoeducational, which means cognitive and academic testing. Cognitive meaning, how are you doing in terms of your IQ or what they would say is maybe your innate ability to learn versus how are you learning? How far behind are you on normed tests, not on you know, the test your teacher gave you or the state test, but on tests that are set across the country for what should you be learning at you know, this age? What should you know now? Um, okay, and all of those things are supposed to go into the IEP. Uh, so for an IEP meeting during COVID, Obviously, they feel pretty different. They still have to follow the SOPM in terms of inviting you to an IEP meeting. It should be seven days before it. Uh, typically, they're sending um, invites via email. Uh, if you don't have email, they should be calling you. Um, and then they should be providing, this is always true. It was uh, not done very well pre-COVID. I have a feeling it's probably not done great now. Um, but they should be providing a parent with all reports and evaluations or anything else they're going to be considering at the meeting. Um, if it doesn't happen and you're a parent on this, what I always do before one of my child's IEPs is I write to his providers and say, hey, are you considering anything? Can you let me know uh, what you have coming up? The question earlier came in about do you have a right to get the draft IEP? Um, I think you can always ask for it. Uh, they, you know, Really, it does make sense if they're all drafting the IEP beforehand, why can't you see what they're saying? It's not finalized, it's just what they're thinking. Um, I think many schools are resistant to doing that. Uh, but certainly, especially because each section is often drafted by a provider, doing the rounds, which it is time consuming, but you know, doing what I do is just go and try to ask everybody, are you gonna ask for any changes? What do you think? Did you do a report? I should know if they're doing an evaluation or report, but I have found every once in a while I don't. Um, ask for that beforehand. Um, if a parent doesn't use email, a school should, this is you know similar to a question we had earlier, um, a parent should be asking for documents to be mailed or the school should be thinking of doing that. Um, and it, all of this should be in the preferred language of the parent. Um, if you are a parent who speaks another language or you're working with a parent who speaks another language, definitely ask over and over again for translation and interpretation. It's really important. They should be doing that. And far too often we see that it doesn't happen. 
And it is hard enough to participate and understand all this lingo as an English speaking parent, it's incredibly difficult if you can't even read the documents that are being provided. Um, one thing going back to the draft IEP, if you don't get a draft IEP beforehand, and that's pretty typical, at the actual IEP meeting, and now they're you know all remote, um, you should be able to ask at the IEP meeting for a copy of the program pages uh, that they're creating. So that's the section that goes through, you know, how many sessions of speech will you get? And are you in an ICT or a small class? Um, in the SOPM, it does say they're supposed to be providing you with a printout of that at the meeting. You also can say, hey, can you send me the IEP without finalizing it so I can read through it and let you know if there's any corrections? Uh, for example, at my son's school now, they all know this about me that, you know, it's much easier for them to send it to me afterwards and I go through it and say, this is wrong. You forgot to add this. And a lot of times it's not even problems. It's just, I'm trying to help them correct it. Um, and that's because I want him to stay in public school and I'm trying to make his IEP strong. Uh, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I do and they work with me with it. Okay. All right, so I will pause here. It looks like there's a bunch of questions in the chat. I know Liliana, if you wanna take some or. Uh, I wanted to just ask, there's two of them. The first one is um, a parent who had made a referral for an AT evaluation in January and keeps getting pushed off. Um, they're saying they're not either not doing remotely or face-to-face -face, and they're still setting up. So her question is, is there somebody available right now? Um, you know, take it away on that one if you want and I'll answer the next one. I think that's not different than the other things. Yes, they should. I mean, my goodness, assistive technology seems of all the ones. This is a time when everybody is using lots of technology. Um, depends on your child. Can they do something remote? Does it need to be in person? Um, but they absolutely should figure this out. Um, and if you're, and especially I can see uh, that it's for a child who's going into the turning five process. So going to kindergarten next year, really important and assistive technology is critical. Um, definitely, you know, if you have gone up the chain or you've gone partially up the chain, go up the rest of it, but then reach out to us as well. And then the next question, which I'm halfway through typing, and I'll still finish is um, a service provider had asked about the IESP process and if it's like an IEP and what entitlements they have um, in the, uh, I would say mistaken belief that they don't have IDA rights because they have an IESP. Would you like to answer that? I mean, I think IESPs are more complicated than an IEP. You don't have identical rights to a student. It, so IESP for people who are like, what the heck are you talking about? Is for a student who's parentally placed, meaning their parents are paying tuition at a private school or they're homeschooling, which Liana explained earlier. Um, you also could get an IESP, but you are not in public school. Under the law, a state does not have an obligation to provide services to those students but they can opt to provide, uh, what is the word, comparable services. Um, and in New York State, they have, uh, so they will provide some services. They're not required to provide, for example, a special education class. If you put your kid in you know, a parochial school, you don't get to say, I want a small class, can you pay for the special ed teacher? But you could say, I want sets, I want tutoring and they could provide a special education teacher or a voucher for you to get a special education teacher to work with your child. Um, so uh, all of that obviously gets a little more complicated during COVID, although to some extent, most people with IESPs are getting uh, services from an independent provider in the first place. Um, so in some ways it's something where they can work it out more individually with them. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, there's a, there's a little bit more to it than that. And my recommendation is to get a notice of your procedural safeguard, right? Um, I'm sorry, a procedural safeguard notice, which is just a list of your rights uh, once this IESP is created, which should better be able to direct you as to what you may be able to do. But if you're getting Department of Education funded services, for example, from the IESP, you should have some rights as well, um, you know, similar to the rights of students who have IEPs in, in that's sort of, hopefully that answers it. All right, let me see if there's anything else. Um, I don't see anything else right now. Keep the questions coming. And if we haven't answered your question, 
please ask it again. We'll try to, we, we might not have understood it the first time around, we'll be happy to uh, try again. And now I think this is me. All right, so for procedural safeguard notices, uh, I'm sorry, I just got an interruption from my daughter. So I'm trying to pretend that she's not there. Um, and it's a little bit discouraging. <laughs> through. All right, so who do you contact? Um, when there are problems. Of course, you can always call our helpline for support and help, uh, but you can contact the Department of Education Special Education Office via specialeducation at schools.nyc.gov. The Department of Education has dedicated um, email addresses uh, for specific issues. For example, if you don't have a response to a referral, um, this is an email address that you can send that request to. You can always copy us. Uh, when uh, the evaluations are not appropriate or you need different evaluations, when you've requested an IEP meeting or an IEP meeting has not been scheduled that should have been scheduled, um, when the IEP or the PAD or the RAD are not being implemented or when you have not received a copy of the PAD and or of the IEP um, and you've made a request, for example, from the school or the teacher, um, this is an email address that you can use to try to solve that issue. There are ways also to escalate when there is a dispute. So escalate, you basically go up the chain of command and the Department of Education is a bureaucracy. So you do wanna go through their, uh, the channels of dispute resolution to be able to solve certain problems. Of course, there are very significant problems that you may not necessarily want to go through uh, an entire process of dispute resolution, but in general, start with the school to try to resolve the issues. So if you don't have a copy of your PAD, if you don't have a copy of your RAD, if you want to make some changes onto the actual document, if there are other issues that you can try to resolve with the school, start there. And then next, well, to the parent coordinator and principal. Um, and then you move up to the district superintendent's office, such as the family support coordinator or the district family advocate. We will there, okay. And then after that, um, to the uh, borough support organization, the ACE, the administrator of special education. Later at the bottom of the slide, you'll find some email um, contact information. So, and then finally, you continue through to the Department of Education Central, the Office of Special Education, um, through these phone numbers, um, 718-935-2007, or Special Education at schools.nyc.gov. For super, school superintendent and borough support organization contact information, visit this website at the bottom, which will be available to you when we send out um, the full presentation. Now, if you were paying incredibly close attention, you may have noticed, hey, that district superintendent's office, family support coordinator, you know, second thing here, you didn't have that with the pad and the rad and going up the chain. Um, and to be honest, one of the reasons you can go there, one of the reasons why we didn't highlight that is we've often found for more specialized special education uh, type things, you're gonna have to go to the borough support organization um, to get help. Yes. All right. Um, so again, there are dedicated email addresses for specific issues that are helpful if you want to be able to get some um, responses relatively quickly. So issues with related services, um, related services at schools.nyc.gov, issues with transition to kindergarten, turning five at schools.nyc.gov, issues with special education services at charter schools. You should email the CSE chairperson and that is the life link that connects you to the addresses for the chair, um, to the CSE chairperson, so chair people. If you still have problems, call our helpline. Um, contact us, let us know, we will try to make this process smoother. If you don't remember any of these email addresses, contact us, we will remember them for you. Now for language access rights, so parents have the right to translation and interpretation services um, if they are not fully English dominant speakers and if they have a preference for their own native language. Um, the Department of Education has to offer translation and interpretation services um, to parents who request it. Um, so they can participate fully in their child's education. In New York City, the main language is spoken and the ones that the Department of Education typically has a bulk of pre-translated materials include Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, French, 
Haitian, or, uh, Creole, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Urdu. And for these languages, you may be able to find on the Department of Education's uh, website, pre-translated letters, forms, meeting notices, and other special education documents. But parents should be getting translations of all of these documents um, in their preferred language. Um, interpretation should be offered at parent-teacher conferences, parent association meetings, suspension hearings, uh, meetings with school staff, and special education meetings for free provided by the Department of Education. Um, the parent does not need to bring their own interpreter, and they certainly please uh, request that they do not use um, anyone other than an adult child for translation and interpretation services. Earlier, somebody had mentioned um, that a parent had limited literacy in their native language and was receiving um, documents that she was unable to read. Uh, for those parents, you can contact the school and request uh, that someone contact the parent by phone um, to inform them of an important um, and relevant uh, changes. However, the Department of Education will continue to send uh, hopefully translated information to them, which then they can bring to a service provider that can assist them. Um, an earlier question asked if the service provider could request to have the information sent directly to them. The Department of Education will send the information to the parent, but not to the service provider. Then it is up to the parent to communicate with the service provider as to what they have received. Um, for language access complaints, when, you, uh, when a parent is not receiving um, their language access rights, they're not getting information translated, they're not getting interpretation at the school, you can contact this phone number or send an email to the dedicated hello at schools.nyc.gov um, to let them know that this is a problem. You can also contact us and we will try to collect this information and, and support um, the, you know, solving the issue. Now, we talked briefly about formal dispute resolution and how to escalate uh, uh, dispute through the Department of Education channels. For special education dispute resolution specifically, when the parent has a problem or a concern that has to do with special education, there are two main ways that these, um, these can be addressed, and these are by mediation or an impartial hearing. Now, mediation is a voluntary meeting between the Department of Education, a parent, um, to discuss a problem, a mediator will facilitate. Um, so this is a person who is not attached to either party and their function is to facilitate the conversation and enable both parties to reach an agreement to solve the issue. Both parties, the Department of Education and the parent control the outcome. So the parent will not agree to something that they do not wish to agree to and neither can the Department of Education do that. And going to mediation, um, does not stop a, a family, a parent from going to an impartial hearing. They can still request an impartial hearing. Now, what is an impartial hearing? It is a legal process where an impartial hearing officer is in charge. Now think of an impartial hearing officer like a trial judge, uh, but it's not as serious as a trial judge. It's, a, it's inside the Department of Education. It is an administrative hearing. Um, the, uh, the hearing officer will issue a written decision based on witness testimony, the information that's provided at the hearing, and the documents presented. Now, either party can appeal a decision, uh, but if the parties don't appeal the decision, the decision is final as much as a, as an, a judge uh, issued order would be. Um, both uh, processes are free of charge. Uh, the parents can certainly seek an advocate or seek an attorney to support them with an impartial hearing or mediation, but oftentimes parents go by themselves. And we have a, in the earlier, Liliana had shown you the um, YouTube site where we have trainings. One of the trainings we did uh, in, I think it was in August, um, was on how to file an impartial hearing or represent yourself and, and do mediation. So we do have a whole training on that because it is a little bit complex. Yes, remember, we're not covering in-depth special education today. We're just covering some of the pieces. Um, we'd love to give you everything that we know about special education, but we wouldn't have the time today. And you certainly wouldn't want to hear all of it today either. All right, so resources during COVID. Um, We've created just a short slide, and Kim, if you don't mind um, just putting all the pieces yeah. uh, 
up there for them to see what's coming up. Just on, on things that are important that are not necessarily related to special education, such as meals for students on remote learning days. Um, so when a child is uh, learning at home, they're still entitled to meals. And it, parents can go and pick up meals um, at a takeout location from nine to 12. No ID or registration required. If you're picking up meals for multiple family members, they could pick them up at the same time. Um, the link takes you to where you would go to pick up um, your meals in the day that a child is in remote learning. For the community members, those who are not students, they can pick up meals from three to five on school days. Again, no ID or registration required and multiple, um, one person can pick up from multiple family members or uh, household members um, at the locations are in the blue link. Um, families, of course, right, still require technology support. So if you don't have an iPad and there should be one iPad per child, one device per child, it's not one device per family. If still at this point, um, students do not have an iPad, um, this is the link to request uh, the iPad from the Department of Education. Oops, if you have an iPad, but the iPad is not working or there are some other uh, problems with the data plan or you don't have access um, to, internet, uh, to internet services to, through, the, uh, through the iPad, um, there's, this is a link for tech support and how you can get um, some, uh, some of those issues troubleshoot, um, troubleshooted. I'm not sure how you say that. Um, if you're in need of childcare, Oops. Yeah, sure you're happy to take him. Oh, no. Um, it's, it's, uh, I'm having some computer issues over here. I no just worries. Uh, for those families, for working families, families who require childcare on the days when they're not um, in school, the Department of Education has a program called Learning Bridges um, that should provide instructional support and um, instructional enrichment and care uh, full time uh, for students from pre K. Not sure if 3K, but 3K through eighth grade. Um, and the way you request it is uh, by clicking on the link that will be in the slide. Yeah. Um, and connect okay. there. Now it's uh, on a, it's admission on a rolling basis. It's sort of first come, first serve, and there are some um, uh, there are some preferential uh, options. So if you're a, a first responder or if you're living in a shelter, you'll get first priority before somebody else comes in. Um, if you need the support, please go ahead and apply. And then finally, and that's the next slide, um, just reminders, we are open, we're virtually open, we're not in the office. However, we are all over New York City. So if you need to reach us, please call our helpline, uh, toll free Monday to Thursday, 10 to four, um, check for updates on our webpage and email us at info at advocatesforchildren.org with questions. Um, if we, um, we're gonna take some final questions now and some reminders, uh, please feel free to type them up. And while we wait, we wanted to thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for the questions, for sharing your time and knowledge. Um, and we hope that um, you fill out our survey and let us know how we're doing. We will send the survey as, uh, together with the presentation tomorrow. It is also the last slide um, on this presentation. When you click on the survey, you will find uh, links to some of the materials that we thought would be good for you to have. Um, so be aware of that. That's just kind of like your, your prize for going to the survey, although we will also send out the materials. Um, we won't hold on, we won't hold back on those. Um, let's see, we have some questions here. Uh, one, of, one, per, one participant is saying that Learning Bridges program has not had enough providers in the closest vicinity to the children's school or home and no transportation is provided. What can we do then? It's a little bit tricky. So Learning Bridges, uh, the program itself is supposed to provide services throughout New York City, um, but there is very little guidance as to uh, how they're offering services, um, who's offering the services, uh, and if there is an entitlement to having a Learning Bridges program be close to a home. So that's sort of a developing area, and I'm so sorry, but I don't have an answer to that, especially where the transportation issue um, is, is related. We, we don't know 
um, unless you know, Kim, but I don't know of any. And the only thing I would say is, you know, assuming you've gone up the chain and asked about it, um, feel free to reach out for AFC. It's not something, you know, we obviously work on educational rights, but during this time, we are trying to think more broadly. Um, and I do think that, you know, it's certainly, we've had a lot of press inquiries about the difficulties families are facing right now. Um, one of the questions that I, I actually don't think we did address was the problems of uh, parents who can't be there during remote learning um, and how difficult it is for many families to navigate this right now. And there are no easy answers for that. For um, uh, some students, it's something where, you know, they really do need learning bridges. Other students need a lot of special education support. Oh, also, while I'm talking, we are going to launch a poll right now. Um, if you're, you know, be fantastic if you can take this poll. It really helps us. Um, and then also, if you can take the survey that will be sent around. Um, we really do appreciate all of the responses that we get from this. Um, but so with Learning Bridges, I guess just you can reach out to us. Um, and it's a kind of thing where, you know, if we do get somebody who's calling interested in it, we can, you know, especially if somebody is willing to talk to the press, um, we can try to help publicize it, we can try to brainstorm around it. Um, but it is a really difficult thing. We've had a lot of calls. One of the things we try to help people understand is what other kinds of supports there are. Uh, so for students with significant developmental disabilities, they might qualify for OPWDD services or for something called um, CDPAP, like a home attendance services. Uh, those systems are also really complicated. OPWDD has now said you can't use their services during school time, which is incredibly unfortunate because it's when uh, many parents actually most need their services so that they can go to work. Um, but it's a, you know, it is a tricky thing. And then another question, um, some students do not get a lunch break at school and it's in school's in session all day. They get participation points taken off when turning the camera off to go eat, to go to the bathroom or take a break when needed. Is there a way to report this and when, where can this get reported? Um, I, this one's the one where we talked about the informal appeals uh, concerns. I mean, some of it might be if you have a child who has a disability and requires a break, and that's a little bit of a different story, but typically you want to start with a school to try to get this issue resolved, um, as it seems to be a school-based issue, uh, before you move up the chain uh, to try to resolve it. Certainly, if after you get, if you get a, a response from the school that seems a little bit too harsh, let us know. Um, and we will point you in the direction where the next steps may be. Uh, but uh, this is possibly where the informal appeals process um, or escalation process uh, would hopefully get your result. Yeah, I mean, certainly if a principal hears about this and you're explaining why it's hard, it may just be that the teachers aren't coordinating their schedule. Um, and that's something where that's completely valid to raise that. And in addition to that, just to add to what Kim just said, if, um, if this results in a disciplinary action from the school, um, we, you can contact us to see what your rights might be, um, but you can also go and check out our disciplinary guide, which is online or at advocatesforchildren.org under the help get help section, um, if, it's, if it's helpful to you. Um, all right. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Please keep them coming. Um, the poll has closed. Thank you so much. Um, and you'll find the last slide here with our webinar survey. Um, I think we can stop the recording now and yeah. we'll stay here for, for more questions.